Hi, I'm Ray with another podcast episode. This time, A Trip Down Memory Lane. There's an original title for you. A Trip Down Memory Lane. This time all about uh, things that you remember from the old days. All sorts of things. Do you remember when in the winter your mum would bring the milk in and it would be frozen? And when the, when the milk was in bottles, it would freeze inside and push off the, the kind of tin foil top, wouldn't it? And then you'd get a, a robin, perhaps sometimes, on the top of the milk bottle, pecking through the top when it wasn't frozen, to drink the milk. Do you remember all that? I remember the milk sticking out with a cream on top of the milk, sticking out the top of the bottle by at least an inch, if not two inches, where it had frozen inside the bottle, forced it up, pushing the cap off and sticking out the top. I remember that. Then also, of course, you had to keep the milk outside. Well, in the 50s, in the winter, keep the milk outside and in the summer in a bucket of water because you didn't have a fridge. No fridge. And there were what I used to call dots in the milk, little white dots, and I hated it. My mum would make a cup of tea. If there were little white dots in it, she'd spoon them out before giving me the tea because I wouldn't drink it. I don't know what the white dots were, bits of curdled cream or something. I hated the whole thing. I hated it all. This episode was inspired by Jennifer, who emailed and said, just ask if people have heard of the witch's hat. Do you remember the witch's hat in the playground uh, when you were a kid? It was a huge cone-shaped metal thing with seats all around the outside. Imagine a hat, uh, you know, exactly a witch's hat. The top was on a, on a pole, a bit like a maypole, I suppose. And it would spin round, but also rock. Look it up on the internet, the witch's hat. And it was hugely dangerous. I remember kids, I'd be sitting on it or standing on it, and kids would be flinging it around and it's crashing against the centre pole. I don't know how there weren't more injuries, you know, back in those days before health and safety. There was another thing, a long, what was that long rocking horse thing called? All the kids would line up on it and it was basically a big long rocking horse. Uh, all metal, all cast iron. That wasn't too dangerous, but you could easily get thrown off that. I remember being, I was on the back. And it was going so fast and high, I just got thrown off the back and landed on the asphalt. Because we had asphalt then, or concrete on the ground. None of this um, rubbery, spongy stuff they've got now. It's good, that, isn't it? That, that uh, rubbery, spongy stuff, it's good. Saves a lot of grazed knees, elbows and heads. I've had a haircut, talking of heads. My hairdresser chap, my barber around the corner, he's closed, he has been for months now, and... My hair's been getting longer and longer. I've been trimming bits off the front and making a right mess of it. So what we did, my wife and I, we bought a, online, we bought a hairdressing kit. So you've got scissors, ordinary scissors, thinning scissors, electric clippers with various attachments. She had a go this morning. It's absolutely brilliant. I've looked in the mirror, you know, hold the mirror in front and look at the back in another mirror. And she's done an amazing job. Now, it was, what was it, £26, I think, from Amazon. My hairdresser visits cost me £10 a go, so I've, I've missed one. We've already got 10 quid back, so I've only got to have another couple of trim-ups with the hairdressing kit, and it's paid for itself. I will go back to the proper barber when things are back to normal, if they're ever back to normal, because he obviously does a professional job. He's been in the trade for, what did he tell me, 45 years he's been cutting hair, so he obviously... <laughs> Well, I was going to say, obviously, hopefully he knows what he's doing. But honestly, my wife has done an amazing job. You'll all be rushing out now. Quick, Amazon, let's buy a, a hairdressing kit. Yeah, for 26 quid, it's not bad, is it? I remember my dad, he bought a pair of clippers, but they were the manual type, you know, the squeeze and release type, not the electric clippers. I remember he bought this pair and, and the scissors and that, and he used to cut my hair when I was, uh, you know, a schoolboy. And it was awful. Honestly, it looked like, well, the old joke, isn't it? Put a pudding basin on your head and cut round it. It looked awful. I remember kids at school laughing at me. And he said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not paying for the barber. You know, he charges whatever it was in those days, half a crown or something. <laughs> half a crown. Do you remember those half a crown pieces? And anyway, he insisted on doing my hair. And it was like a short, do you remember, short back and sides. When I was a bit older... Uh, at the, the big school, well, the secondary modern school, 
I used to go to the barber there. I wouldn't let him do it then. I mean, good grief, this was the early 60s. And I remember the barber, he said, short back and sides. And I say, no, I want a Boston. Do you remember a Boston? I mentioned that to my hairdresser the last time I saw him. Well, that was about a year ago. <laughs> I haven't seen him for a year. And he said, oh, I remember the Boston. Yeah, he could do that. He said, do you want me to do that now? I said, no, no, no. Then he said, do you remember the DA? You know, where it goes down into a point at the back, like the, uh, how can I put it, the rear end of a duck. A duck's, yes, rear end. That was quite popular. Of course, back in the 50s, what I missed out on was all the Brill Cream and the, the quiff at the front, you know, the Teddy Boys and all that had the quiff at the front, all Brill Creamed, and they'd spend hours. I remember... Uh, my friend's older brother who lived a few doors away I was round his house once and his older brother got out this aluminium comb and he called it his glamour spanner and he put all the brill cream on he was off out somewhere for the evening probably looking for girls <laughs> and he got out the brill cream and did all that and then with the glamour spanner he combed his hair got all the quiff bit just right at the front I remember him doing that jet black hair he had it's interesting looking back at things, isn't it? I love old photographs from not only, say, 50s, 40s, 30s, but going back to 1800 and something. I found a few recently in my hometown. And, you know, you look at how it was then and what it is now. And I tell you what, to be honest, I really love the way it was then. There's a park near us, a big park just by the hospital. And I found a photograph recently online of the park and there was a big lake in the park, a huge lake. It was lovely. And this, you know, this was 1800 and something, late 1800s, I suppose. And it was lovely. There were kids around there, people pushing prams around the lake. And all it is now is just sort of grass and asphalt paths. It's, it's got no character. In fact, I found quite a few photos of where I am now, where I live, round and about the various areas. There were ponds and, and lakes all over the place. Well, ponds especially. There were ponds everywhere. Every sort of spare bit of land. Well, there's a lot of spare land, wasn't there, back then. But even in into the you know 1920s, 30s, 40s, there were ponds everywhere. And they've all gone. They've filled the whole lot in and covered it all with concrete. Having said that, there is a huge amount of land here in the UK that's not built on. Not only farmland, but just, you know, National Trust or whatever it's called, land. Um, the South Downs Way. Look that up if you're online. Have a look on the South Downs Way. You look on Google Maps, for example, at the UK. Um, take where I am down here on the South Coast. You have a look. If you zoom out, the, the land, a lot of it's farmland, yes, but the land that's not built on, yeah, it's quite good, actually. Let's hope it stays that way. I wonder, do you remember a week or two ago I said, I'd like to come back in a million years' time and see what's happened to the planet? I reckon it will all be countryside, forests, you know, all the houses would have gone. Mother Earth, Mother Nature would have taken back. It was, right, that's it. Get out, you lot. <laughs> You've messed it up enough. Get out. I'm taking it back and doing it my way. But, yeah, as I say, have a look from your know, Google photo, uh, Google Maps or whatever, and look at the amount of land there is in the UK. Let's hope it stays that way. OK, email here from Larry. Hello, Larry, in Birmingham. Do you remember? He starts off. Yes, I do. I do remember, Larry. Dustman with big leather pads on, say, the left-hand shoulder. Huge leather pads. And they would pick up the dustbin, heave it up into the air, and put the bottom of it on this pad, on the shoulder pad, and walk it out to the cart, tip it into the cart, then take the, the dustbin back to the person's house. Those dustmen, they must have been pretty fit lads. I mean, what are they called now? Refuse collectors, aren't they? They were dustmen then. Apparently, so I remember someone saying to me, they were called dustmen because they used to collect the dust from the bins. People would put dust in the bins. Funny how names sort of stick, isn't it? They, I mean, they don't collect dust. Now I suppose they do a little bit from vacuum cleaners. But of course, back then... There was no recycling. Everything went into the dustbin. Oh, apart from probably some people had compost heaps because a lot of people grew their own veg and stuff like that. And they would save all the scrap food, you know, peelings, potato peelings, carrot peelings. All that would go onto the compost heap and then become a, a good good um, mixture of compost to put in your bean trench. Runner beans. 
put an old carpet in the bottom, an old carpet that keeps the moisture, soaks up the wet, then put all your compost in, then fill it in with earth, and then plant your beans. Perfect. One from Ernie. Hello, Ernie. He says, do kids play in the streets anymore? They do, Ernie. In my, Well, they've grown up now. Um, about 10 years ago, there were a lot of kids in our street. Every summer, they'd congregate together. You'd buy a lamppost or something. They'd spread out a blanket and they'd have their various bits and pieces, uh, you know, bicycles and, uh, you know, kiddies' bikes and trikes and stuff like that, and their toys. And they'd all be out there on a lovely summer's day. There were loads of kids in our street. Of course, that was, oh, I don't know, about, as I say, about 10 years ago. They've grown up now. We've got some new kids on the block. <laughs> new kids on the block. But they're only, what, we've got the girl over the road. What's she, about three? Uh, one, yeah, and one or two others are kind of five, six years old. So they're not out in the street yet. But give it a few years and they will be. We were out in the street all the time after school and over the woods. But talking about the street, though, Ernie, yes, playing marbles, fag cards. Remember the fag cards? That was great. You'd prop them up against the, the wall and then you'd flick your cards and, and you knocked over. How did it work? You kept them all, didn't you? You kept your opponent's cards. And with marbles, yeah, I remember I remember losing my tours. I had half a dozen tours. Do you remember tours? And I lost them all in one game. Oh, that was a disaster. I won them back eventually over the you know, the next days or weeks or whatever. Talking of fag cards, do you remember cigarette machines? This is from Maisie. Uh, where are you, Maisie? Oh, you're in Wales. Excellent. She says, do you remember cigarette machines? I do. Because uh, when you got to, I mean, the age of, when could you smoke back in the old, I think it was 16, you could smoke legally or something. I, I can't remember. Kids smoke younger than that. But if you went into a shop, most shopkeepers would just sell you the cigarettes. They didn't care how old you were. But if you looked really underage, you could just go outside to the cigarette machine on the wall, put in a half crown or two bob bit or whatever it was, and get 10 or 20 fags. Uh, so <laughs> no one was bothered about age or anything like that. Just go and buy your cigarettes out of the machine. I remember they used to jam up. I remember that. Oh, it was dreadful. Because you then have to go into the shop and say... I put the money in the machine and it's jammed up. Of course, if you were a youngster, they didn't believe you. Oh, you're trying it on. They come out, look at the machine, nothing wrong with that, and you've lost your money. That didn't happen to me, but I remember it happening to friends of mine. You know, they genuinely had put their money in their two bob bit, and the thing didn't work. And the shopkeeper accused them of trying to con them. So you know, they lost their money. I was always afraid of that. Oh, when I was older and I smoked, if ever I used a a cigarette machine and this is the ones in the street not in pubs they used to be in sort of shop doorways and things like that out of the rain and they're always jamming up and you lose your money people tried not to use them I mean, you could go into the off license here you know, when i was older i'd go into the off license or in, into a pub and buy them of course then they had machines cigarette machines in pubs didn't they uh, when were they introduced into pubs i can't remember but i, I do recall the cigarette machines appearing in pubs and you put your you know, put your money in and open the drawer. They jam up. <laughs> I don't know why they jammed up. A bit like parking meters. I remember losing twenty pence because they took twenty pence pieces, didn't they? Parking meters. Do you know in our town, I remember the main sort of street through the town. It must be half a mile long. Is it? I don't know. It's all paved over now. But you could drive both directions right the way through the middle. It was great. You could park it anywhere you liked. If you wanted to go to a certain shop, I remember doing this. Drive down the town, park outside the shop, nip in, get what you want, back in your car, off you go. These days, no, no way. You've got to go to an expensive car park, pay a fortune to park there. You only want to pop into a shop. I think that's what keeps people out of towns. But the parking meters, I remember them appear. I think it was someone said to me recently, 1958. They were first introduced to the UK. And the idea was all right, but they used to jam up. Do you remember a little yellow flag thing would come down through the window you look at and it would say excess or something. And then the parking meter man would come along and you'd be fine because you had gone over the excess time or something. And you're also done for feeding the meter. So if you're walking around town, you know, you've put an hour's worth in and you're walking around town, 
and you think, um, I'm going to be a bit longer, you nip back to the meter and put another coin in it, you could be done for that. That was called feeding the meter. You weren't allowed to do that. And then all the parking meters, what happened then? They all disappeared, didn't they? I remember they were all dug up. The chap that used to empty the, the meters and fix them and you know take out the coins, he was a short chap. He was the same height as the parking meters, what, about sort of four feet high. He was a little chap. Ideal job for him because his, his face, his eyes, were actually level with the meter. Colin, now, yes, Colin, I'm sure everyone remembers what you've written here. The Corona lorry. Do you remember that in the UK? The Corona fizzy drinks lorry. I mean, that, that should go down, well, it has, in history. It would pull up outside all the fizzy drinks on the back of the lorry, cherryade, lemonade, limeade, every age you can imagine. Of course, we'd shout out, Mum, Mum, the Corona man's here. <laughs> and she'd, oh, oh no, as she grabs her purse, oh no, we'd go out there, I want cherry aid, no, I want orange aid. And she, <laughs> she'd have to buy all these bottles of Corona fizzy drink, probably full of sugar, full of dreadful colouring, and oh, goodness knows what. But we all survived, didn't we? We all grew up and survived somehow. Of course, it's a, an unfortunate name that now, isn't it? The Corona lorry, what with, with coronavirus. Do you know, I was listening on the radio the other day. I was thinking about this episode, listening on the radio, thinking back to when I was a kid, summer holidays, off school, out in the woods. And I thought, well, how about the kids now in lockdown? They can't get out. What, what do they do? I try to think back to when I was a kid. Imagine being just locked in the house and garden. That's it. You can't go out. You're not allowed to go over the park. You can't go over the woods. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't go swimming. Not that I could swim. It must be awful for kids now. And I heard, you know, this self-harming. Um, kids now, children, I should say, as young as eight, are self-harming. And that means cutting themselves and things like that. It's awful, isn't it, to think that that, that is happening to children as young as eight. What is it all about? I don't know anything about it. And of course, back in my day, in the 50s, when I was, what, eight years old, I didn't know of any other children that were having problems or difficulties. Did they have trouble back then? Did children get depressed? Or did they feel suicidal? Did they self-harm, as it's called? I don't know. I've talked about this with various people, and none of us, you know, from my era, none of us remember any children being depressed or doing anything like that. I mean, OK, some kids were bullied at school. They got picked on. That's been happening, you know, since the beginning of time. Kids get bullied. Funnily enough, oh, it's another story, really. But uh, I chat to some local radio amateurs you know, on the radio. It's really good. We've got a, a group of us who have a chat. And there's one idiot on there. He, I don't know what's wrong with him. He doesn't speak to certain people. And I said to him, look, that's what kids did at school. Come on, we get, we're now... 60s and 70s now we don't do this not speaking to each other and throwing our toys out of the pram anyway he's now added me to <laughs> he's now added me to his list of people he doesn't speak to on the radio how pathetic is that going back to my day at school i don't remember load they talk about children being obese these days i mean i'm overweight but i've got an excuse i'm old but children uh, obesity in children. I don't remember that as a kid. You know, I can look back and think of, I mean, I've seen pictures of my school, uh, you know, my primary school, junior school, secondary school. I find various pictures online. Um, fortunately, I'm not in any of the pictures, but you know, the school photos, all the kids, if anything, they look thin, not overweight. So wh what is it that's caused all this? And I also I was thinking while listening to this program, uh, it's probably the wrong way to look at it, but if at school they said, right, that's it, you can't go to school now for the next six months. What? Next, I would have been over the moon. Six months off school. I hated it. That would have been fantastic. I suppose, though, having said that, if they say, right, you're off school for six months, you're not going over the woods, you're not going over there to play with your friends, you're not climbing trees, you're not going to the park, yeah, I suppose then 
that is different, isn't it? You're shut in your house and garden, if you've got a garden. But this self-harming, um, I don't know anything about it. It's only recently I was listening on the radio, as I said, and I thought, good grief, kids as young as eight doing this. You know, what's happened? I must read up about it, see what's going on. Anyway, let's move on to another email, shall we? Let's find something a, a bit happier. Hello, Roger from the UK. Transistor radio, under the bedclothes at night, listening to Radio Luxembourg when you're supposed to be asleep. We've all been there, Roger, or I certainly have. I remember that. That was fantastic. I originally had an old mains you know, valve radio by the bed. It went wrong. One night I was listening to a play on the radio. It was really good. The BBC used to do sound effects, not electronic, real sound effects. So walking on gravel, if someone's walking up a gravel drive, they'd have a, the sound department, the effects department, would have a pair of boots and a tray of gravel and they go, you know, with the boots in the gravel to get, and it was a genuine gravel sound effect, of course. And I was listening to this play and my radio suddenly went bang. And I thought, oh no, halfway through the play. So what I did the next day, I took the radio out into the garden. I took the, the chassis out of the cabinet and I plugged it in and <laughs> I thought I'd repair it. Well, I couldn't repair it. I was about 10 years old. I got a huge electric shock. Whoa! Threw me halfway across the garden. So that was that. The radio went in the dustbin. And I then pestered my parents for a transistor radio, which I got, of course. That was, oh, getting my own transistor radio was fantastic because that would fit under the sheets, under the bedclothes at night with a torch. Tune round on the dial. There it is, 208 Radio Luxembourg. Yes, I remember that. How many people remember that in the UK? Well, not only the UK, because uh, Luxembourg covered most of Europe, didn't it? So any listeners anywhere else in Europe, do you remember Luxembourg at night under the covers? Of course, mum or dad would come in and turn that radio off. There we are. Bloody Nora. Do you remember that? Who was Nora? Bloody Nora. <laughs> or blinking Nora. you still got that radio on. Who was Nora? I wonder. That cro uh, cropped up recently. I forget. I was, uh, was, I was talking to someone on the radio. And he said that. And I said to him, who was Nora? No one seems to know. It's funny, isn't it, the things used to say. Uh, the things that parents used to say. There was another one, Gordon Bennett. Who was Gordon Bennett? Why would someone say Gordon Bennett? Um, who, what was it? I remember someone, a friend of mine's parents, his mother used to say, if it was raining... She'd say, it's raining over Will's mother. I don't know who Will... Who was Will's mother? It's raining over Will's mother. My father-in-law, if he heard a baby crying or a toddler crying, he'd say, oh dear, Johnson's not happy. And I said to him, who's Johnson? He'd say, I don't know. <laughs> who's Johnson? It's funny if I hear uh, an elderly person come out with these sayings, the glass is falling or the glass is rising. That's the barometer. My grandfather used to say that. He'd tap the barometer and say, oh dear, the glass is falling. I never knew what he meant. The I thought he meant a glass of water was falling off somewhere or a glass falling out the cupboard. But, uh, I, I discovered later. Of course, he'd say to the neighbours, oh, uh, glass is rising, might be in for a nice day. <laughs> if you saw a neighbour over the fence. I still say that, actually, only just to wind people up because they don't know what I'm talking about. We've got several barometers in. I went mad. A few years ago at boot sales, I kept buying barometers. Long ones, round ones, square ones, tall ones, short ones. We've got barometers all over the house. And I go around tapping them. I know you're not meant to tap them, but I do. And the other thing was people would say, oh, there's a storm brewing. Uh, I still say, because our house from the front of the house north, we could see over the downs. And I always say it's getting black over the downs. Look at that sky over the downs. It's getting black. There's a storm brewing. So I think some of these old sayings from decades ago, they do stay with you, don't they? They do stick with you. People used to say, you'll catch your death of cold. And I could never work that. I'm still not quite sure. Catch your death of cold, I suppose. Why is it? Do you know, I've wondered this all my life. Perhaps someone can answer. Why is it that if you go out, you might have to go and post a letter and it's raining and you get wet. Then people come back and they're at you 
That is, oh, I think I've got a cold. I've been out in the rain. How does the rain give you a cold? I mean, you get this on the telly, don't you? Someone will go out, they get wet, they've had to walk home, it's pouring with rain, they get into the house and they've got a cold. Oh, oh, excuse me, I've been out in the rain, I've got a dreadful cold. What a load of rubbish. I mean, it's, you don't get a cold, do you, from going out in the rain? Well, I've been out in the rain, I've got soaking wet, and we went to London. Oh, we went to London on a coach trip. All our lot, I forget what it was, oh, it was the military vehicle lot, was it? I think we went with them. Of course, the first thing they all did was head to a pub. Well, we didn't want to do that, you know, my wife and I, we wanted to have a look around London. So we're walking around, we went to a fair distance from wherever they were, we didn't get lost, and it started raining. Hard, torrential, monsoon, like forest monsoon rain, and we were getting soaked so we didn't know where to go. They, there was no shelter anywhere. There was a park. I don't know which park it was. We rushed into the park thinking there might be a pavilion or something. We got soaked through. Every item of clothing we were wearing was dripping wet, literally dripping wet. My shoes, my leather shoes, the leather had soaked up the water. And it was only sort of lunchtime. And we had the coach was going back about four. Oh, I said, right, well, we both said, never again. Never, ever again. Raining cats and dogs. I mean, where's that come from? It doesn't rain cats and dogs any more than it rains goldfish and turtles. I don't know where these sayings come from. And I've mentioned before, haven't I? I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Why would anyone go to the foot of their stairs? They're going to stand. What do they do? They stand there and look up. They look up the stairs. What do they do when they've gone to the foot of their stairs? I, I was... I, is there... Um, is there one I'll go to our house or something? I can't remember. I think initially when it started raining in London, there were a couple of others with us. And was it Nigel? Nigel said, oh, let's hop on a bus. And we, we didn't want to do that because, I mean, we'd get lost. Start going somewhere on a bus. Well, where do you, you've got to get off. We went into a subway. I think that he went, did he go on a bus? I can't remember. Then we ended up in this park. And it was by a pretty busy road. There was just not even a bus shelter to stand in. So that was it. I didn't like the whole thing anyway. There was one place we went to, and I can't remember. Was it the War Rooms? Have you been there? Was it Churchill and the War Rooms, I think we saw? That was really good. Later in the afternoon, I think the sun did come out a bit. So we were able to sort of steam a bit in the sun and dry off. As I said, never again. Talking of coach trips, went on one to France once, uh, you know, through the Channel Tunnel in this coach old load of people it was the booze run was it or the fag cigarette run or whatever it was called and halfway there the coach driver said you've all got your passports ready haven't you I said yeah 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 got our passport and this one chap he's searching his bag and his pockets and he said i haven't got my passport i must have left it at home and the coach driver said well you're not going to get through you'll have to get off the coach and <laughs> we were out i don't know where we were on the way to Ashford is it or wherever and uh, anyway he dropped him off at this roundabout <laughs> this bloke said oh I'll get off here he said there's a garage over there or something uh, and a cafe he said I'll get off here he'd forgotten his passport uh, I remember friends of ours did that all the way to Gatwick have you got the passports yeah got the passports good when they got to Gatwick they hadn't they'd left the passports at home nightmare my passports ran out ran out about five years ago I suppose I ought to do so, well, I don't know, I'm not going abroad. I only go to the Isle of Wight. Don't need a passport to go there. Do you remember toasting things by the fire, you know, the coal fire, the open fire? I mention that because we've just been given a couple of toasting forks. We've got a real fire that we have going in the winter. And we stuck some, um, what are they, currant bun things on? To uh, tea cakes, aren't they? We stuck a couple of those on and sat by the fire the other evening toasting these tea cakes. Really nice. I, I actually dropped, <laughs> I dropped mine into the coal, but it was all right. I hauled it out again and brushed it off, and it was fine. I remember dropping them into the coal years ago, back when I was a kid. Oh look, it's gone. Oh never mind. Hook it out, dust it off. That'll be all right. No germs, of course, in that sort of heat. Toasting things, bits of bread and cakes, <laughs> whatever we could get hold of, stick it on the toasting fork. A train has just gone past. We're not far from the railway. A train went past and reminded me. We used to play in the railway sidings. 
Can you imagine that? Playing in the railway sidings. You know, coal trucks. Some empty, some full of coal. And sometimes you get some railway man coming along. Oi, get out of here, you lot. Clear off out of it. <laughs> and we used to hide. We used to hide under the trucks. I remember doing that. Because there were a lot of railway sidings back in the 50s and 60s. Well, of course, steam engines were still running then. When did they stop? 67, I think, the last one. And we'd, you know, we'd play around in the railway sidings. We'd be under the trucks, on the trucks, in the trucks. Once a friend of mine, I said, the train's about to go. It had all been hooked up. This whole row of coal trucks had all been hooked up. And he was in one of the trucks. And there was this railwayman coming towards us. I hid in the bushes. And he hid in the truck. And I was saying, get out, the train's going to go. Anyway, as he started to clamber out, the train did start to move off. This railway chap went mental. I just stayed in the bushes <laughs> out of the way. This railwayman went mental at this friend of mine. He grabbed him, hauled him down off the side of the truck, Oh, all sorts of threats, and if I ever see you here again, brrr, and he said he was going to call the police, but he'd, I mean, you'd have to go back to the station and find a phone to do that. Didn't have mobile phones then. But that was great fun, playing on the railway sidings and taking uh, train numbers. Uh, that was good fun. As well. I never quite saw the point of it. We took car numbers as well, sit on the corner of a street writing down car numbers. I'm not quite sure what the point of that was. I suppose train numbers are different because you can look for the same one coming back again later on in the day, I suppose. Uh, I'm not too sure. But it was, it was fun. That's what kids did. In fact, what was that? I had an email here from um, Doreen. Well, I can't find it now. But she was saying people all think that girls back in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, young girls, wore frocks, white socks and Mary Janes. And, and the boys wore shorts. She says, that's not true. I, I find the email. I've got a bit of paper here somewhere. She said, that's not true. She wore jeans and so did the boys. Now, when did jeans come in? Uh, I, I know they had them in America, but when did they come in here? She said she used to go around with the boys. Several girls did, a whole crowd of them. Perhaps six boys, three girls, whatever. She said it wasn't all girls at home in frocks, Mary Janes, white socks, playing with dolls and dolls houses and little prams, uh, and boys playing with model cars. She says it wasn't like that at all. I don't know what sparked... Oh, here's her email. Here we are. Hang on. Yeah. She doesn't say what sparked off that train of thought there. But uh, anyway, Doreen, thanks for that. Yeah, I do remember girls joining us. Uh, not, I don't think on the railway sidings. <laughs> but certainly, you know, we're over the woods, we're over the park, we're mucking around. It used to be girls as well as boys. It wasn't just us climbing trees. They were up the trees as well. A lot of the things we did back then as boys well, and girls, we got dirty. Kids don't seem to get dirty these days. Playing on the railway sidings in the coal trucks, I mean, we were black. We looked like coalmen. We were absolutely black. I remember parents saying, where have you been now? Good grief. We also used to lift up drain covers. You know the drains in the street, the big cast iron covers? We used to manage to open those and then get a bit of string with a magnet on the end, drop that down into the filthy water see what we could hook up perhaps a, a bunch of keys or other bits of metal or whatever we could hook up from there and you couldn't reach the bottom and we did try to reach down to see what was in the muck at the bottom and when you think about it it, it was disgusting doing that sort of thing but that's what we did yeah you know, we got filthy we went over the woods and got filthy i remember once we were poking around down a drain and this do you remember the French onion seller people on bicycles? They'd have all these onions hanging off the handlebars. This chap stopped. <laughs> he was actually English. He put on this French accent to make out he was a, a Frenchman with all these onions hanging off his bike. And uh, one of my friends have told him to mind his own business. He then started to speak you know, proper English. He wasn't French at all. He was saying, get, clear off, get out of that drain. Whereas at first it was, oh, 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 all this, I can't do French accents and stuff. But um, I remember the French people, and I used to wonder, how did they get here? If they genuinely come from France, well, this chap hadn't, obviously. If they genuinely come over from France with a load of onions, how did they get here? Did they come over in a, a rowing boat? You know, I used to imagine a rowing boat coming up onto the beach, and this, this chap unloading his bicycle and all his onions, and then cycling around the streets trying to sell them. I don't know, of course they've gone, haven't they? So the rag and bone men. 
They were good, the rag and bowmen. I used to follow the horse and cart, see what he's got on the cart, see if there's anything worth nicking off the cart <laughs> while he's trotting along with the horse. But there never was, it was just junk on there. Going through these emails. Marion. Yes, I do remember Tupperware parties. Everyone had a Tupperware party, didn't they? And you know, people, all these decades later, what, 50, 60 years later, or more, we've still got Tupperware. We've got Tupperware. That is original, 60s, whatever it was. And it wasn't it a lifetime guarantee, the Tupperware stuff? You could understand why. Because none of it ever goes wrong. It's it's fine. We were still using stuff. In fact, in my shed, I've got Tupperware pots and things that I keep bits and pieces in. And they're fine. You know, they've been misused. They've been full of nuts and bolts and whatever. They weren't designed for that. But they're fine. There were various other things, weren't there? Um, other parties that people would have. I can't think now. But there were, I don't know, perfume parties and Avon. Do you remember the adverts? Ding dong, Avon calling. Do you know that's still going? How about that? Avon is still going. And I remember that as a kid. So it's obviously successful. It must be. Then there was the Little Woods catalogue. There were all sorts of catalogues, weren't there, back in the old days? Of course, now it's all online. Everything's online. But there's still a catalogue. Um, I think we still get an Avon catalogue. And I don't... There's No, there's not Little Woods and K's was another one. I, th I mean, they're all still there, I think, but they're online, aren't they, these days? Do you know, we had a power cut the other day. That happened quite a lot. I mean, not a lot, but it, it happened considerably more than it does these days. The power the other day went off for about three, maybe four minutes. That was all. But of course, that was enough, wasn't it? The computer, clocks, digital stuff, the microwave clock, the Alexa devices, everything, <laughs> everything got messed up. The internet, you know, the router thing went down. All, oh, dear. It was only off for three or four minutes. But that reminded me of the old days. In the winter, lights would go off. Oh, here we go, power cut. Everyone had candles at the ready, just in case. It didn't happen all the time, but as I say, far more, far more then than it does now. Very rare. I was quite surprised when uh, the power went off. I was at the computer and suddenly, what's happened? The screen's gone. Everything's gone dead. What's happened? Just not used to it. And we got a security light um in the stairwell above the stairs and uh, I went out there to see what was going on the light was on of course so that works first time that's ever come on I fitted that light oh must be five six seven maybe eight years ago never had a power cut in all that time never seen that light come on in the stairwell it's not a security light is it it's emergency lighting I did that with a view to looking after things when we get older uh, imagine having a power cut in the night when you're old well I am old but even older you, know, you might get up and want to go down the stairs. Everywhere's pitch dark. You can't start looking for torches and stuff. So that light comes on if the power goes off. Try to get a lot done in the house and garden while I'm still young enough to do all this. Because the trouble is that the mind thinks that, oh, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that, but the body won't do it. You know what I mean? As you get older, you still think you're young. I mean, I, I'm afraid of tripping over. If I fall over, if I break my hip end up in hospital that could be it you know that worries me and sometimes I forget I'll go trotting down the garden oh I'll do this I'll do that and I forget hang on a minute <laughs> just because I'm young inside I'm not young outside and I can't do things anymore it's so frustrating it's so annoying things I used to do I can't anymore I have to get someone else to do it well these days with lockdown no one does it the job doesn't get done talking of getting jobs done do you remember I said I've retired recently? I used to repair and restore vintage valve radios from the 40s and early 50s. Well, I've stopped doing all that now. And a chap phoned me the other day. He said, I know you've retired. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, I know you don't do any work anymore, but can I just drop my radio around for you to do? <laughs> I said, uh, no, I've retired. Oh, I know, I know, yeah, yeah, but. And it's this yeah, but again. I've had this several times. I know you don't repair radios, but... It's like kids, isn't it? Can I have a sweep? No, you can't. Oh, yeah, but. No, there is no yeah, but. <laughs> I do not repair radios anymore. End of. And he was quite disgruntled. Oh, oh, so you won't even look at it then? Oh, OK, well, if you won't even look at it. <laughs> he put the phone down. I thought, oh, you miserable uh, devil. That's the word I'm looking for. Miserable devil. I'm either retired or I'm not. I'm either doing radio repairs or I'm not. 
and I'm not. I, it's no good. I mean, if I say yes to one, then it'll be, oh, can you look at my... Yeah, all right, then I'll end up... Well, I haven't retired at all, have I? That happened, actually, in the first two weeks. I had a, a record player to do. I had various things to do. And I kept saying, well, look, this is the last job. Oh, yeah, but... <laughs> I don't know. How things have changed in the old days you'd retire. Mind you, I suppose you retire from a job and go home. But I think I've said before, I, I knew people that retired and there'd be retirement drinks. Oh, well done, you know, you're 65. Yeah, enjoy your retirement. And off he'd go. He'd leave the radio and TV workshop three months later or even less. You know, Bill, what are you doing here? That was his name, this chap, Bill. He came back. He said, oh, I'm fed up with retirement, bored sitting at home with the missus. I've come back to work. And he got <laughs> he got his job back. Can you believe that? He got his job back after, what, two, three months of, of retirement. Boredom. I can't see I'm going to become bored. How am I going to be bored? I've got, oh, I've got my hobby, of course, my radio amateur hobby. I've got uh, this engine, this Lister stationary engine I want to get going. I want to fully restore that. I've got gardening. Both my wife and I do gardening. I've got to refelt the shed roofs, a couple of sheds they both need to felt redoing. I don't know that I'm going to be able to do that. I'll have to try. Um, I suspect with my wife's help, we're both managed somehow, but I certainly won't be bored. There's so much I want to get done outside. How people can be so bored, they go back to work. I just have no idea. Oh, look, it's black over the downs. There's a storm brewing. That's what I was saying earlier. It is, there it is, over the downs. That's the South Downs. Have a look on the map, South Downs. And you'll see, because I'm on the coast, and the downs are just behind me. And the funny thing is, in the summer... You drive down the side of the downs and the temperature really does increase far hotter than down here by the sea. And in the winter, it's clear of snow here and it's not too bad. Drive over the downs, there's snow and ice and the temperature really drops. So we get a, a kind of being by the sea. Also, we're in a bit of a bay here, plus the south downs to protect us. We do quite well weather-wise. We will very rarely get extremes of weather which I don't think anyone wants. My son lives in uh, North Carolina. He said at night, sometimes it can go down to kind of minus 10 or something daft. And in the day, it can go to sort of plus 30. And that's a huge temperature change, isn't it? I don't know that I could cope with that. Talking of freezing cold, do you know, when we were kids, you know, I mentioned ponds and lakes all over the place. There was a pond. It wasn't a lake. It was just a pond. I don't know, what, 20 feet across something... Uh, yeah, perhaps perhaps 20 or 30 feet across. And in the winter, it was really exposed and used to freeze solid. And of course, we used to walk across the ice, you know, only in our shoes, walk and sort of skid across the ice in our shoes. And it was great fun. And it was only one day when this farmer chap came along and he said, you you lot shouldn't be doing that. Oar, me man, you like farmers do. Oar. Why are they Farmer Giles? He said, oh, you shouldn't be doing that there in that pond. And we said, no, that's all right. He said, no, in the middle of that pond, because <laughs> we were saying it's only shallow. He said, no, in the middle, there's a well, a, an open well. And he said, it probably goes down about 60 feet. Said, oh, my goodness. I mean, I can't swim. Well, I suppose anyone, any kids, even if you can swim, you go through the ice and straight down the well. Uh, in freezing cold water. I don't know, that could be, well, <laughs> that could be tragic. So, of course, we all gingerly stepped our way across the ice and got off the pond. And I remember in the summer we looked at it. We threw stones, you could see in the middle, we threw stones as it was sort of a plonk, as it was deep. And all around the opening to the well, it was shallow. And it was, you know, it was a good job that farmer had said that because if we'd fallen through the ice, well, dread to think. It was also a great place for sticklebacks and frogs and all sorts. We got frogs, did I tell you? I can't remember what I've told you and what I haven't now. We got frogs in our little pond, it's only a small pond. We break the ice on it every day because the frogs, they hibernate in the silt and mud in the bottom of the pond and they breathe through their skin. There we are, oxygen out of the water or whatever, through their skin. How about that? Anyway, that's enough of ice and cold and chill and horrible deep wells. <laughs> Farmer Giles. It was always Farmer Giles, wasn't it? In the old days when I first went to work in the 60s, there were no Christian names, you know, it was um, with the with the boss. 
you know, he was Mr. Smith or whatever he was, Mr. Johnson. And that's the way it was. It, you know, he would call us by our Christian names. I remember one day in the radio and TV workshop, there were two rays there, me and this other chap, two rays. So to distinguish us apart, what the lads did, I don't know whether outside the UK, but on UK TV, there was this duck thing, late afternoons, kind of children's programmes. There was this duck called Quackers. So what the lads decided to do was call the other chap Ray, and they'd call me Quackers. <laughs> Stupid. It stuck for years. Quackers. I didn't look anything like the duck. Anyway, I was Quackers. So one day the service manager, he was saying, where's that tape recorder that was brought up? It's an urgent job. Who's doing it? And this chap, John, he said, oh, Quackers is doing it. The service manager went mental. He said, what? He said, Quackers. He said, who the hell's Quackers? And he swore a bit as well. He said, well, Little Ray. He said, well, why didn't you say Little Ray? What's this Quackers nonsense? <laughs> he had an absolute fit. He came over to me and he said, is it all right? How are you? I said, yeah, I've done it. I've done it. It's all right. It's all right. Mr. Smith. That wasn't his name, but that'll do. But yeah, it was all Mr. This and Mr. That. Couldn't call him by his Christian name. That TV program, um, Are You Being Served? It was just like that in the workshop. You know, there's Captain Peacock and uh, was it Mrs. Brahms? Is it? I can't remember their names now. It wasn't Christian names at all. I remember going into the shop because the workshop was upstairs and sometimes an engineer had to go downstairs to the shop, talk to a customer about something technical. Of course, you go down there and there was, <laughs> there was Mr. This and Mr. That. I don't know, it was funny. Funny how things have changed over the years. Even at school, I think I mentioned before, the teacher would call us by our, our surnames. You know, Smith, Bloggs, Johnson. You know, it wasn't sort of Ian, Fred, Dave. <laughs> and we had to call them Mr. So-and-so or Miss whoever. I remember what our English, oh dear, our English teacher, she used to wear these stockings. She was, I don't know what, mid-40s, I suppose. Used to wear stockings. And she had black hairs all over her legs. Oh, we used to laugh because the stockings would crush the hairs and you'd see them all through the the material of the stockings. All these curly black hairs all up her legs. Oh, I won't tell you what nickname we had for her. All the teachers had nicknames, of course. No, it wasn't Mrs. Brahms. It was Mrs. Slocum, wasn't it? Miss Brahms, Mrs. Slocum, Mr. Humphreys. Um, that was John Inman, wasn't it, Mr. Humphreys? I'm free. <laughs> Oh, it was good telly back in those days. It really was good TV back then. All the programmes, you know, open all hours and stuff, and uh, Kenny Everett. Do you remember Charlie Drake? What was his uh, line? Oh, hello, my darlings. Do you remember that? Harry Worth. Uh, he'd do the thing on the shop window, wouldn't he? Do you remember that in the shop window? Tony Hancock, Eric Sykes, Hattie Jakes. Oh, just brilliant TV back then. I won't say it's all rubbish now because, well, I can't because it's all repeats. We're still watching the same stuff now that we did in the 60s. Someone said to me the other day, you know, I'm doing up this engine, this um, Lister stationary engine. I was talking about the magneto on it that produces the spark. And someone said, oh, is it Lucas? Made by Lucas. Yeah, it is. Do you know, Lucas, going back to the old, the old days, there were names, weren't there? Like Lucas, they made all the electrical bits on cars. Lucas switches and the indicators, the regulator, the relays. It was all made by Lucas. And in the house, all your, your sockets on the wall, all the PowerPoint sockets, they were MK, weren't they? They were names, Lucas, MK, they were good names. And uh, all, all British, of course. But these days, there, there's nothing like that. You know, whatever you seem to order online or go into a shop to buy, none of it <laughs> seems to be British. I don't know what's happened, but they were good old names. Lucas, MK, Bush Radio, HMV, Marconi, Echo, all these radios. I mean, some of the names are still around. You buy a Bush Radio these days, look on the back, it will say made in China or made in Taiwan. So it's not a Bush Radio at all, really, is it? The only thing that's Bush about it is the sticker on the front which is a shame. Someone bought me a record player the other day. I did I did repair one, but they had this other one, which I can't do. It's got a CD player in it, and it's all kind of sealed up. It's made of, where was it, Taiwan or somewhere? It's all sealed up. You can't repair it at all. And she said, do you know anyone that could fix it? And I said, well, I'm going to be honest, because a friend of mine, I said, look, you're not going to get it repaired. 
And if you do find someone to do it, it's going to cost you more than it would to buy a new one. Isn't it such a shame that it's gone like that? In the old days, you could repair things, whether it's an iron, a toaster, a television. You could just go to your local electrical shop and they'd repair it. And, you know, if you bought a new appliance from anywhere, it didn't have a plug on it. There's just the bare wires <laughs> on the end of the flex. There's just bare wires. You had to fit your own plug. Do you know, if the youngsters these days, can you imagine them? What? I've got to go buy a plug. Where do I buy a plug? How do I put that on? No, I mean, I'm not being rude to youngsters, but it's not their fault. They probably never put a plug on. They never have to. Why, why would they learn how to put a plug on to a, an appliance? All appliances these days that you buy have got plugs already. But back then, I don't know, it, people did a lot more for themselves. It wasn't all done for them. Do you remember, was it last week I mentioned food? These days you, you can buy grated cheese, grated carrot, <laughs> peeled potatoes. I mean, back in the old days, you do it all yourself. We were a nation of shopkeepers, weren't we, in the old days? Supermarkets ruined that. So that's our fault. We shouldn't have gone to the supermarkets. We should have supported a local shop, which I still try and do if I can. If there is a local, well, mind you, local shops now are all closed because of COVID. But in the old days, you could go to your local electrical shop, have things repaired, local greengrocer, what was it, candlestick maker, butcher, baker, all these shops you could go, knitting shop. Do you remember everyone used to knit, didn't they? They're all at home knitting. Even old ladies. I remember seeing old ladies sitting in the pub. You know, they'd gone out for a few drinks with their husband and they're sitting in the, in the corner of the pub and they're knitting. You know, the husband's chatting to some mate or other and, and the wives are having a chat together and they're all knitting. Everything was knitted. Who remembers, as a kid, having to hold your, your hands out, you know, fist-shaped hands, to hold the, the wool? What was that called? Was it a hack or, no, or something? You call it, a, I forget. But you have to sit there as a kid with your hands out and this wool around it while your, your mum or your granny wound it all into a ball. You know, it'd be slowly sort of unwinding from your hands and she'd wind it up into a ball. That's how you bought wool in those days. I think they sold balls of wool as well. But uh, it just shows, uh, I mean, there were specialist shops, you know, wool shop, knitting needles, all the gear for knitting stuff, patterns and all the bits and pieces, the paraphernalia that you needed for knitting then the off-licence. Do you remember there were, apart from the off-licence, there were specialist tobacco shops. I remember that, where they sold, obviously, tobacco and cigarettes and pipes and pipe cleaners, lighters, lighter fuel, uh, pipe tobacco, all to do with smoking. Whatever you want to do with smoking, they had it. I suppose these days we, we've got a, something similar, which is these vape shops is it vape it is isn't it do you know that's funny i was following someone in a car recently i was driving along behind them and suddenly out of the driver's window this massive cloud of smoke i, <laughs> I thought the car was on fire and i could smell it even though i'm behind in my car i could smell it some i don't know some flavored stuff whatever it is but they've got special vape shops haven't they and I've also seen people walking along the street. If you're behind them, you don't necessarily know that they've got one of these vape things. And suddenly, out of, it seems out of their whole head is this massive cloud of smoke. And it stinks. Actually, some of it smells quite nice. I can't tell you this, but every night I can smell what, I don't know what it is. It's tobacco, but it's rather nice. I think it's someone out in the street every night about the same time. It just sort of wafts in the window because we have the window open at night. And I think, oh, oh, that's rather nice. I used to smoke. That's rather nice. It's probably cannabis or something. I mean, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I've no idea what cannabis smells like. How would I know? Yeah, I was around in the 60s. So, uh, well, I mean, I have no idea. I'm a upright pillar of the community. I have no idea what cannabis smells like. I know I've asked you this before, but how many of you oldies out there? <laughs> oldies. How many of you oldies would like to go back to the 50s or the 60s? I, I'm always banging on about this, aren't I? Harping on about it. I would love to go back. I must stop doing that. I must stop trying to... I'm not trying to live in the past. No, I mustn't say I'm living in the past. I must stop, I suppose, wanting to go back. Hankering. Is that the word? Hankering for things the way that they were. I don't know. 
I must stop all that nonsense. As I've said before, it's uh, one thing looking back at the past, but how about looking towards the future, into the future? What are things going to be like? You know, will we have keyboards on computers and iPads? Will you just think or just talk to it? I don't know. Will we still have pens and bits of paper? I often wonder what the future is. Well, I'm only going to be around uh, for, what, another 20 years or so. Hang on, hang on. Am I? No, hopefully a bit longer. <laughs> a bit longer. I don't want to shorten my life. A bit longer than that. But what will it be like with the advent of the internet and computers and online shopping and stuff? I think your fridge is going to... We're having talking fridges. No, not talking fridges. What are they? They're online fridges or something. So they can tell the supermarket... I've run it, I'm getting low on milk, I've run out of butter, and the supermarket will say, right, got you, that'll be delivered, and it'll just turn up. And you'll think, oh, oh, look, that's handy, I was getting low on milk, and it's just turned up. Oh, and we've just about run out of butter. That's handy, that's turned up as well. It'll be like that, won't it? I'm sure it will. I wonder whether you better fiddle it and say, I'm running out of beer. Yeah, tell the fridge I'm running out of beer, when you're not really, and then you could get beer <laughs> Beer deliveries. No, you still have to pay for it. But all this, um, what is it? it? What do they call it? This internet. Um, I don't know. Th- things on the things online. You know, your washing machine. If it's getting low on soap power or something, it will tell the supermarket to deliver some. It'll be interesting as the years go by now into the future to see just what is going to happen. All cars are going to become electric. Do you think? that all this stuff going green and electric, people are saying, ah, that's all very well having electric cars, but they need charging, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on the generating stations and the national grid, and it's going to actually pollute the place even more than if you just had an ordinary car engine. What are your thoughts on that? Email me, that would be good. Email me on that one. I'm in two minds about that, because these cars have got to all be charged. It's going to put a hell of a strain on the national grid so the power stations are going to have to up the output and unless i don't know i saw a thing online yesterday a huge field full of solar panels somewhere in germany no electricity coming out of them at all why because they're all covered in snow (laughs) so there's all these solar panels massive acres of them that normally produce i don't know megawatts of power and the voltage out of them is zero because they're covered in snow. And you can't go, I mean, you can't go around sweeping snow off them all, especially when it's snowing, because it's just going to be covered in more snow. There was a cartoon, I think, something to do with that, where people were saying, well, it's snowing and there's no wind. So the turbines aren't turning. The solar panels aren't producing anything. And they're saying, they're sitting in a cave, I think, by a fire. Oh, well, we'll have to go back to the way it was thousands of years ago. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Email me, raiserants at protonmail.com. Shame about the MP3. You know, I wanted people to send in MP3s. Didn't get any. Not one. Most of you said, oh, I don't know how to do it, which is fair enough. But I just thought it would be great if you could send in a little recording saying, I'm Fred from Scotland and I'm cold. <laughs> Or whatever, just to say hello. And I could, you know, fit the audio in. But there we are. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Be great to hear from you. So what should we do next week? Any ideas? Well, there'll be the midweek message, won't there? So any ideas, let me know for next week's podcast episode. Been great talking to you. Great having you here with me. I shall see you next Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye for now.